Welcome to the Innovation Accelerator podcast, brought to you by Innovacer, the health cloud company. We're on a mission to connect and curate the world's healthcare information to make it accessible and useful. With Innovacer, everyone works in the service of patients like never before as one. Visit us online at innovacer.com. Welcome back to the Innovation Accelerator podcast. I'm your host, Steve Ambrose. The statistics around prescription drugs in the U.S. are truly eye-opening. Each year, more than 4.5 billion prescriptions are filled and dispensed. Now, 75% of all primary care visits involve prescribing medication, and two-thirds of U.S. adults take a prescription drug. 40% of older adults take at least five drugs a day, and 20% take 10 or more drugs. We know medication is an essential intervention in the treatment and prevention of disease, and look, prescription drugs bring many benefits. However, the CDC notes that adverse drug events, or ADEs, in the U.S. are responsible for 1.3 million emergency department visits every single year. On its own, medication non-adherence accounts for up to $300 billion in health care costs each year. Now, these are just a few of examples of challenges that need to be better addressed, managed, and optimized through a process known as Comprehensive Medication Management, or CMN. On today's show, we're going to open up a powerful conversation on CMM with some of today's top experts. And we're privileged to have with us today, Katie Capps, Executive Director of Get the Medication Right Institute, Robert Fortini, Vice President of Care Coordination at Catholic Health Services of Long Island Partners. Corinne Leong Lee, Director of Pharmacy Services at Catholic Health Services of Long Island ACO Partners. And Dr. Paul Grundy, Chief Transformation Officer at Innovacer. It's really great to have you all on. It's a privilege and a pleasure. And before we get started, I'd like each of you to share a little bit about yourselves with our listeners and viewers. And we're going to go in order of introduction. Katie? Thank you, Steve. I'm delighted to be with you in this terrific panel today. Um, my background and experience, I was a hospital administrator for 12 years, so I had a deep and broad um, experience in operations. And then I moved to the employer world and supported a group of employer CEOs that were interested in value-based purchasing at the state level. I then moved to Washington and formed my own consulting firm and supported organizations like the Primary Care Collaborative, the eHealth Initiative, and a number of other organizations that were launching initiatives in the Washington area. Uh, I've been in Washington for over 25 years representing organizations that are interested in reforming the healthcare delivery system. And today, I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Get the Medications Right Institute. So I look forward to a terrific conversation today. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Robert? Greetings. My name is Robert Fortini. I am actually a pediatric nurse practitioner by professional training. I've been in some form of nursing and hospital administration for 40 years now. Um, I have four children and four grandchildren, which have taught me more about pediatrics than any training I've ever gone through. Um, currently, I'm uh, employed by Catholic Health of Long Island, and I am responsible for their care coordination team, uh, which is integral in managing our patients through transitional management and chronic care management to uh, do as well as we can at de decreasing utilization and in improving our payment in value-based contract models. Uh, pharmacy is a big piece of that, as you will hear as we continue. Thank you. Corinne? Hi, um, thank you for having me on the show. And I just wanted to say that um, I've been a pharmacist for over 30 years. Um, practicing out of New York State. Um, I've worked mostly in institutions such as hospitals, um, and I've also been the pharmacy director of a large skilled nursing facility, and I'm now employed at Catholic Health uh, Physician Partners, 
in which I handle a lot of uh, medication adherence, um, managing patients' medications, and also helping with any patients that may require questions of um, scheduling, um, dosing of medications. And I work with providers and statin use managers um, and hopefully to increase their adherence to medications and keep them out of the hospital. And Dr. Grundy? So I'm Paul Grundy, uh, Chief Transformation Officer and Innovator. And I got dubbed the godfather of the patient-centered medical home quite a few years ago. When I kicked off what became the patient-centered medical home movement, and that really got started because my boss at the time, the CEO of, of IBM, had a drug-drug interaction and almost died. Um, he had five specialists without any adult supervision. And, uh, and so, you know, that really led me to reach out to other folks like me. We pulled together 47 of the Fortune 100 and, and really began to insist on robust primary care and team-based care um, to manage a population more effectively. Thanks for that, everybody. Let's jump right on in. I'll start off with asking for a definition of comprehensive medication management, or CMM, and how it differs from medication therapy management, or MTM. Katie? Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you the verbatim definition, and then I'll offer you context for this definition, because I think it's really important to to um, note that one of the areas that the Institute is particularly interested in is ensuring that there's a adoption of a common definition of CMM. And part of that has to do with the history of MTM. Um, CMM is basically the standard of care that ensures that each patient's medications, whether they're prescription, non-prescription, alternative, traditional vitamins, or nutritional supplements are individually assessed to determine that each medication is appropriate for the patient, effective for the medical condition, safe given the comorbidities and other medications being taken, and able to be taken by the patient as intended. And the reason that I feel it's important to read the definition is, is that that was a definition that was brought to us in 2012 while um, Dr. Grundy was the president of the Primary Care Collaborative as a result of a, an important work group uh, co-led by individuals like Linda Strand um, at that time from the University of Minnesota, um, Dr. Ed Webb from the American College of Clinical Pharmacy, other um, others within the group from physician organizations. Um, and it's, it's important to note that CMM is a more comprehensive process of care. And, and the reason the Institute is particularly interested in um, ensuring that we have a common definition is because we were, we were led uh, astray a bit with the implementation of Medicare Part D and medication therapy management services because CMM different, differs from traditional MTM in that um, the Medicare Prescription Drug Program, the Improvement Modernization Act of, of 2003, really was an early attempt to promote medication optimization. Unfortunately, it didn't go far enough. Um, and the, the term medication therapy management was adopted um, as a covered benefit of, uh, under Medicare Part D. And in the Medicare Modernization Act, it requires that prescription drug plans develop MTM programs for their Medicare beneficiaries, but it states that MTM basically be provided by a pharmacist or could be provided by a pharmacist, and it identified only five core elements, um, medication therapy review, a personal medication record, a medication-related action plan, and intervention or referral and documentation and follow-up. All of these activities can occur uh, basically without a team and frankly, without interaction or collaboration with the patient. So I would say that one of the biggest differences between what we consider MTM and comprehensive medication management is comprehensive medication management is a team-based collaborative approach where the medication specialist or the clinical pharmacist is working in collaborative practice with the physician or another prescriber to ensure 
that those medications are safe, effective, and appropriate and can be taken as intended. But the most important different, uh, differentiator is that the patient is in the center of that transaction. Um, it falls to some of the activities uh, that you've heard before, nothing about me without me. So the care plan is developed collaboratively and the care plan is developed with the patient for the patient with the rest of the team. You know, that's really interesting you bring that up. I just want to ask a quick follow-up to that, if I could, Katie. And that is that, um, you know, right now, one of the hottest topics in healthcare is data interoperability and how in many healthcare facilities, data is siloed off and isn't really put to its fullest use. It sounds like to me that with, with CMM, as opposed to M MTM, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, newer next level step up, it sounds like to me, too, what's happening is you're able to not only pull together the pharmacist into the whole team, but also bringing more real-time data together. Is, is that right? There's no question about the importance and the reliance upon clinical data specifically. Um, claims data can be useful, but specifically clinical um, data, because one of the important steps of the comprehensive medication management process is determining whether clinical goals of therapy have been met. And you cannot do that unless the information flows to the treatment team or the interprofessional team particularly the clinical pharmacist. So yes, the answer to your question would be absolutely. And the flow of that information or the liberation of that information so the full team has access to it is essential, Steve. When you think about it, Steve, you know, oftentimes the physician and their team is the only one that doesn't know what happened to that medication. <laughs> the pharmacist knows that the, that the doctor didn't, that, that, that the patient didn't fill it. The patient knows that he didn't fill it. <laughs> Um, the pharmacist and the patient, may, you know, know that they're not taking it. Um, but the clinician, um, you know, assumes that he writes a prescription and that medicine is taken. Um, I, I'm a healthcare ambassador for the nation of Denmark, and and there it's really integrated. So, you know, um, if you're if you're dispensed a medication, um, when you push it through the through the aluminum foil, the system knows whether you've actually dispensed it yourself, right? Um, so that feedback loop is amazingly important in terms of the ability for everybody on the team to understand, you know, whether or not medicines are taken and then, you know, what happens then. Um, but all that data needs to be needs to be fed in. Um, if I can add to that. So I get a lot of um, claims data information coming from a lot of the payers. And I do notice that um, none of the claims data really matches what's on the EMR. So a lot of times the physician thinks that they have prescribed that patient is taking it, but the claims data does not capture it. So when I speak to the patients most of the time, um, I will get doubts of starting the medication because they read the side effects in the internet or the medication is too expensive. So a lot of times the physician doesn't know and then actually assumes that the patient is taking it and then when the disease states gets worse, then they go back to the physician and then they sometimes either change the dose, change the medication, assuming that they've started that medication. Yeah, I was with a patient once that came in to see their doctor um, because they weren't sleeping at night. <laughs> and because, because this was in Denmark and, and, and the doc could see, and, and the doc said, you're not sleeping at night because you're not breathing. <laughs> you know. Why aren't you taking your asthma medication? And uh, you know the patient said, "Because it makes my stomach sick, right?" Um, and so the conversation completely changed from this is about sleeping to why aren't you taking your asthma medication and how can we correct the putting giving you the correct type of medication so, so that you actually get some oxygen um, to be able to sleep at night. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to add that um, I actually spoke to a patient when I was at one of the physician practices in which he complains that he has to get up at night quite frequently to go to the bathroom. So when I looked at his drug regimen, he takes um, furosemide twice a day. So he was taking the first dose in the morning and the first and the second dose at bedtime. So I said, no, if you're ordered or prescribed for um, a furosemide twice a day, the second dose cannot be after 4 p.m., the latest, um, because if not, you're going to get up frequently to go to the bathroom, and then there's the risk of falls. 
you know, because they're getting up in the middle of the night and so forth. So um, it's a lot of uh, advice that I give to patients um, when I do speak to them. And as you said, with the asthma, you know, a lot of times um, patients would come in to see the physician, tell them they have shortness of breath, they have asthma. So they write a rescue inhaler and send them off. So um, a lot of times when they look at the claims data, I would see that in a six month period, they've probably filled the rescue inhaler every month. And each unit has 200 actuations in each um, inhaler. So, you know, that patient is not controlled. So I, um, what I would do is I send notifications to the providers, you know, let, listing all the claims data, how often they fill the rescue inhaler so that we think when they see them that they could, um, you know, prescribe a controlled inhaler. Yeah, and I would like to add to that, Steve, because you ask about the important um um, opportunity that we have to ensure that clinical information flow to the point of care. Um, the other area that differentiates CMM from MTM is this is whole person care. So it's it's basically uh, all the conditions that that individual has. So evaluating their clinical state and their clinical condition and in what way other medications that they might be on might impact their their medication regime is also important. A 2018 study estimated that 275,000 lives are lost and almost $530 billion are wasted due to avoidable illness and death resulting from non-optimized medication therapy. Katie, what are some of the biggest design flaws in the U.S. health system that you feel are contributing to the mismanagement of medications and their negative impact? Thanks, Steve. Uh, it's that's a really good question, and if and if I could, I'll just back up a bit to kind of put that five hundred and thirty billion, or, or or exactly five hundred twenty-eight billion dollars in context. You know that that five hundred twenty-eight billion dollars that's wasted is really attributable to additional um, nursing home visits, hospitalizations, ER visits, physician office visits, or new medication needed to fix the problem created because medication was misused, overused, underused, um, and, and was not addressed. Um, and as you said, there are a significant number of flaws in the healthcare delivery system that create those that situation. I, one is an underinvestment in primary care, to be honest with you. I mean, we, we, we underinvest in primary care, and primary care physicians today are on our hamster wheel. Um, you know, they only spend um, less than 30 seconds talking to a patient about a new medication. Um, they don't have a lot of time to go into an explanation about how the medication should be used or any of the side effects of that medication. Um, so underinvestment in primary care, I think, is important, uh, is an important issue. Um, also, our dogged fee-for-service system. We know that we're moving as a country toward a value-based payment model. Um, we cannot move toward team-based care in the absence of value-based payment models that reward investments in development of teams that can work in a collaborative fashion with the prescriber, the physician, the nurse practitioner, whomever, um, to ensure that those medications are safe, effective, and appropriate. You know, the, the fee-for-service environment makes it very difficult to support and a team. Lack of care coordination um, is a result of that. Um, we, we're not really paying across the continuum of care for an episode of care. So that makes uh, the fee-for-service um, system is, is really preventing us from doing many of the things that could, could help optimize medication use. Another area, I think, is um, interoperability. And we're talking about across a team how the team should function well and work together, how the medication specialist, the clinical pharmacist could work with the other team members, the nurse, the social worker, or the primary care physician or the specialist, but also interoperability from a technology standpoint to make sure that data is liberated so it flows to the point of care so, so that interprofessional team has insight into what is going on. So when they are working with that patient, um, they are able to evaluate what the needs of that individual patient um, or the needs that that individual patient has presented with. Um, 
you know, information is in a million places. Physicians really don't always know the medication regime that their patients are on. Um, it could be They could be treated by a specialist who may prescribe other medications. And while that information is supposed to come back to them, it does not always flow back to them. So I think some of the fundamental issues around interoperability, data, care coordination necessary, team-based care essential. And then finally, I think a new and emerging area is use of companion and complementary diagnostics that will help us target correct therapies. But you have to have an interpreter at the point of care, and you have to make sure that there is a process of care that you're using to um, leverage those diagnostic findings at that point of care. I'd love to hear what the rest of the group um, feels or some of the fundamental issues, but in our experience from an institute standpoint, those are some of the, the big problems that we see or the barriers to implementation of a more rational medication use process that will allow us to optimize medication use. So if I could add to what Katie just, just suggested was fundamental issue, I think what, what I looked at was fundamental and foundational to a delivery system that works was a human relationship of trust with the primary care provider. When you look around the world and when you look within the United States at systems of care that work, there is somebody that's accountable for the overall management of that patient care. And, and if it really works, he's part of a team or she's part of a team of multiple others that, that are focusing on that care. Fundamentally, that healing relationship of trust in a primary care provider, that, that individual, that clinician should be focused on two things, difficult diagnostic dilemmas and relationships. Everything else is better done by somebody else on the team. Corinne would do a much better job of focusing on and managing the management of the medication because that's what she's trained to do. You know, as a clinician, I had limited number of hours of experience in doing that. You know, the, the, the case manager would probably do a much better job in population health, you know, in, in the role that Robert plays. Um, the nurse educator might do a much better job at that. But if we really had um, a healing relationship of trust with a clinician and they were accountable for the overall management of care, as happens, for example, in Kaiser, as happens, for example, in the VA, as happens, for example, in Denmark, you know, you tend to see many less medical errors. And you tend to see less issues like what happened to my CEO when he had five specialists and nobody in charge of the overall management and almost dying from a drug-drug interaction. If I may, I would just like to add to that. And Dr. Grundy, you've heard me say this many times in the past. The essence of Western medicine is pharmaceuticals. Why not have the subject matter expert thoroughly integrated into that care delivery model? It just makes sense, period. I would like to add to that. I mean, what we know people are going to be on medications. I think we know that because 80% of the way we treat and prevent illness is through medications. But we also know, I think, that being on or staying on the medications is not the value we seek um, or should measure. Having a better patient outcome as a result of that medication um, optimization is really the value that we seek. So to, to Bob's point, I think it, it, it is important um, in team-based care to consider in what ways we may integrate or should integrate those medication specialists. And Robert, not, not only is it foundational to, to a delivery system, it's the simplest thing. It's a heck of a lot easier to get a, medi a, get a patient to take a medication than it is to get them to lose 30 pounds and keep it off. I mean, you think about, you think about what's complicated. Um, I mean, the simplest thing you can do to improve somebody's health, if a medication should do that or could do that, is for them to get the right medication and take it. <laughs> yeah, but the only problem with that is um, not all medications work the same way for each individual. So it has to be, I guess, customized per individual. For example, um, African Americans do not respond as well to ACEs and ARBs. They would prefer calcium channel blockers with diuretics, or um, you know, it, it it depends on each patient population and how they respond to certain medications. 
That's such a great point, Corinne. And Dr. Grundy, I want to get back to you on your point before about data. What role do you see data, cloud computing, and unified patient records playing in improving CMM? I mean, data will do for the pharmacist's minds. Data will do for the doctor's minds. Data will do for the patient's mind what X-ray and imaging has done for our vision. It'll make it clear what we need to do, right? I mean, if you can if you can understand that whole that whole pathway of a medicine being prescribed, of a medicine being dispensed, of of a medicine being taken, and then the action on that to the patient and the outcomes to the point that Catherine made, um, you know, you have a picture of of what's going on, and you have an understanding of what of of, of how it works, and you know, it's just a matter of not being in the blind, right? I mean. Data and the ability to have interoperable data and the ability for <clears throat> for medicine, no matter where it's dispensed, um, no, ma- no matter, you know, th- the understanding of that um, is really going to make it clear to our minds what what we need to do for the patient. And if you don't have that data, you know, you're going to mess up every time. And I think, Steve, if I could add to that, there's there's three places in the comprehensive medication management process um, that, that data and information or having access to the right data and information can be valuable. One is in evaluating whether clinical goals of therapy have been met. You know, it's important that data flow to the point of care and you have a, a an entire clinical record to determine that. The second one is in making modifications or changes one might want to make to the care plan or the medication plan and monitoring that and monitoring what that impact is. And part of that may be companion and complementary diagnostics, rather. Um, And then the third area is, you know, CMM is an iterative process. So it's it's part of the evaluation and follow-up process as well to ensure that those medications are being taken as intended. So, I mean, you, 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 you move up the, 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 you move upstream to determine um, what is needed based on that total population. And then as you go through the process, data and information become vital and essential to monitoring, managing, adjusting, and ensuring that um, the care plan and the medication plan are being carried out. And, and, with that, you've drawn a circle around one of the biggest problems that we have, uh, and that is integrated data. Um, you know, most health information exchanges at the state level are an all-out opt-in model. So people have to sign up to get uh, in, um, enrolled. Um, uh, many, several states in the Midwest have an all in opt out model, which is m- much more uh, um, informative. When we do med reconciliation on a patient who's being discharged from the hospital and doing transitional care management, if they're not from one of our own Catholic health hospitals, we can't see their med. All we get is ADT information, admission, discharge, transfer information. We don't get diagnostics, we don't get pharmacy. And it's very, very difficult to be effective. And you all know that when uh, hospitalization scrambles a patient's medication, it is very, very important to do an accurate med reconciliation at at the time of discharge. And we're just not able to do that with our current HIE model, at least in New York State and Virginia. Yeah. And I'd like to add to that, um, if I may. So a lot of times... um, you know, when the patient is being discharged from the hospital, uh, the physicians just click on the medications they were on prior, not realizing that a lot of times during the hospital stay, medications were adjusted, uh, medications were uh, discontinued, medications were, um, had the dose changed, and the physician just go and sometimes on an error or the the discharging um, person, you know, not realizing that they would change, they would just go and add them back on to what they were previously on before the hospitalization. So a lot of times the pharmacist would decipher and read through the information, read through the notes, and, and you know, figure out which ones they're currently on. So that way the medications are not duplicated. Catherine made a point of, of saying that comprehensive medication management, including nutrition. 
Um, and, and an episode that we had in, in one of our clients in Iowa, we began to see an uptick in hospitalization for our type 2 diabetics. We began to see hypoglycemic events, which were requiring them to be hospitalized. And when we looked at the data, when we began to understand what was happening with the data, we could see that that event was occurring in a few zip codes and it was recurring at the end of a pay period. We, we identified a population that was just running out of food. I mean, you know, I mean, and that's a very important element of, of treating, you know, your diabetes and you're certainly going to get hypo, hypoglycemia if you're not eating. Um, but we, you know, literally identified uh, with data the ability we began to understand that, you know, we could then take that population and refer them to a food bank um, and then monitor that. Um, and that data goes back into the system. And so that's just another element of, of comprehensive medication management is understanding the relationship between all of those elements. Really good points all the way around. I'd like to go ahead and shift the conversation into healthcare costs. And Robert, a question for you. According to a Kaiser Family Foundation poll in March 2022, three in 10 people state that they haven't taken their medication as prescribed due to costs. So how can patient costs be addressed and helped if that's a key barrier to proper medication management? Sure, sure. Thanks, Steve. Several several uh, points here. Um, it's a sensitive issue with many patients. You know, they go to the pharmacy, they realize they can't afford it, and they won't even tell their own physicians that they couldn't afford it because they're embarrassed. Okay. Um, you know, the the option to use low cost generic uh, alternatives is is always there, and that's where the role of that clinical pharmacist in the primary care practice comes in uh, so importantly because, you know, there are there are generics and then there are low-cost generics. We in this country pay an awful lot of money for sugar coating on our pills, whereas mm -hmm. if we could have our, our patients take a pill twice a day, morning and evening, rather than once a day with a sustained release, we would slash the cost dramatically, okay? I know that we're all... Uh, waiting with real hope that the Inflation Reduction Act, which is which is going to hit President Biden's desk this week, is going to make a big deal and a difference because it will um, allow Medicare to negotiate pharmaceutical prices and, oh my goodness, cap the cost of monthly insulin at $35. That's, that's huge. That is absolutely huge. And, and, and you know, it's not just... Um, those who are financially challenged or of, a, of a, an inequity situation with, with um, socioeconomic uh, stress, um, it's everyone. And I'll use an illustration. My daughter's allergic to beads. Well, the um, medication, I forget the name of it now off the top of my hum, Corinne, you could help me out if you can. EpiPen. EpiPen. When it w went up, it was like six or seven hundred dollars for an EpiPen. My my daughter couldn't afford to buy an EpiPen. So what was the alternative there? Having her go into an anaphylactic shock after being stung by a bee? I bought the EpiPen for her. So it's 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 simple things like that, and um, I'm I'm very pleased that uh, that uh, we we've, we've finally made some political progress on the topic. Um. I just want to add to that in which a lot of times patients would get a prescription um, from their provider and it's an expensive medication. They go to the pharmacy to fill it and they find out the price and they don't take it because they think that, you know, um, it's too much. It's either um, medication or, or putting food on the table for the family. So um, I think it, it is a sensitive topic in which patients uh, would not discuss sometimes with the provider that it's a financial impact on them. But I think that, you know, it's something that physicians should ask um, patients or should have some sort of knowledge of how the patient's financial background is. So that way they'll be more inclined to um, prescribe something that's less expensive or genetically available. Um, so that way they can be adherent to their medications also. That's a really important point. I mean, again, going back to data, in a modern data platform that, that feeds into the system of care, 
Um, really important element is understanding of the social determinants of health. You really need to understand, you know, where you're at with that patient if you're going to be effective in, in caring for that patient. If you don't, you know, you're going to have that story that I just told about hypoglycemia and hospitalization. But the point is that whenever somebody doesn't take medicine like that, ultimately it's going to cost the system more money. Because the cheapest thing you can do is to take a medication. When, when, when we did a study looking at that, if people took their medication as prescribed, it, the, we, saw, we saw a 19% reduction in hospitalization, right? And hospitalization is what's expensive. Well, and I would add to that that adherence, Steve, is, is only about 15% of the medication therapy management problems out there. You have the whole host of the other issues and problems out there that can that, that could and should be addressed. Um, but it, but adherence is, is certainly an essential component of that. But the patient's information and, 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 and awareness of how to take those medications and how to access those medications is also something that um, a clinical pharmacist as part of that interprofessional team can help address both from a time standpoint, because they have more time than the primary care physician, and the VA has done a terrific job of showing how effective that is, and also from a knowledge standpoint in terms of making recommendations for other therapies that may be less expensive that that physician should or could consider to help ensure that that patient achieves clinical goals of therapy. I completely understand where everybody's coming from. I, I simply want to throw out the point here, and I think just to maybe put a bow on it, that financial concerns are very real concerns. And even though patients certainly should be doing the obvious and right things, as should you know other companies, it, it really is a problem. Affordability is a problem that doesn't seem to be going away. Would you agree with that? And I would say our political leadership has come to that conclusion as well, um, with the passage of the, uh, w with the pass pa pass passage of this recent act, which is going to, I think, cap a total medication cost for those who are under Medicare to $2,000. Uh, so, you know, that's a huge, huge breakthrough, but absolutely. I mean, a huge issue is affordability. And again, we are the most expensive by far nation in the world. Uh, for getting a medication. Yeah, I think there are three A's, affordability, access, and appropriateness. And you really should, from a public policy standpoint, consider all and the impact on any side of that equation. We're talking about a lot of innovation and change, not just around medication management, but within the system as a whole. And I'd like to ask, uh, Katie, we'll start with you on this. I'd like to ask you, what type of unique partnerships and new model thinking in healthcare do you see as driving greater success for comprehensive medication management? I don't know that they're necessarily new. I think it's just a continued support for um, primary care. But I think we do need to have a new and different mindset around how we define advanced primary care. And, it, and I think we need to look at advanced primary care as, a, as, as an opportunity to offer value-added services that can be contributed by the team members that they surround the patient with. So when we look at advanced primary care, we should also be thinking about interprofessional team-based care, not solo practitioners and necessarily paying more for solo practitioners, but ways in which that primary care physician surrounds herself with a team, a medication expert in the situation of um, medication management or medication specialist like a clinical pharmacist in the area of social determinants of health, a social worker, um, a nurse um, in certain areas that require activities in that area, but really surrounding um, surrounding the patient with a team and having that primary care physician as the quarterback of that team. I think also with companion and complementary diagnostics that are available today, it behooves us to recognize that some of those companion and, and complementary diagnostics can give us insight into ways in which we can target correct therapies. And one of my colleagues on the panel, Corinne, mentioned that not all individuals respond to medications in the same way. 
Similarly, not all individuals respond to medications in the same way. So I think use of those companion and complementary diagnostics and support for that physician on how to interpret those findings is also important from a partnership standpoint. And then I think the role of technology and in what way that can help enable the team to move forward to ensure that those individuals receive a very personalized care process. You know, I mean, understanding the patient, I think, is really important. I mean, an example of that is that we're all pretty frail. And as we get older, our mind gets a little bit more frail. That's when we take most of our medication. In one of the systems that, that I've been involved in, um, the dispenser has a little chirp that reminds them on their cell phone that they should take, they can choose which bird they want to chirp from. But if they don't take the, med the medication after they've been reminded, then they get a little message that says, that that their that their chance of winning the lottery will go away, you know that behavioral economics, that understanding of feedback is really important. But taking that to another level, we're increasingly going to have more information about whether a, a particular medication will actually work for the patient as we get into genomics, right? As we begin to understand the genetics of an individual, that information is going to be increasingly more available. Some of it's already available. Um, um, my wife who had breast cancer, you know, the understanding of, of her genetics was really important for her treatment, but that's going to continue to, to, to expand. So understanding both the patient and the interaction with the patient and, and down to the individual personalized level of that patient medication is going to be really important. You know, Dr. Grundy, one of the things that you bring up that's so interesting is this idea about behavioral economics and I know that Get the Medication Right Institute calls really upon a, a patient-centered or patient-involved approach uh, with CMM. You know, the thing is, though, even with the right information, even when you have physicians engaged and, and clearly educating the patient, are there any particulars around behavioral economics or, or nudge psychology or that sort of thing? Is there anything that you can speak to or, or maybe others on the panel here around helping the patient empower them, rather, to become more responsible in taking action. Yeah, again, uh, an example that, that I really love is, is, you know, having a dispenser which actually monitors whether the patient's taken the medicine when you push it through the aluminum foil and a feedback loop that, that supports that. Um, and again, um, uh, in, in one particular case in the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, I've seen that, and also in Denmark, and boy, you know, that, that has resulted in a huge reduction in hospitalization by just monitoring that, particularly, the, particularly with things like asthma and, and chronic, any chronic disease is, you know, the understanding that you actually can monitor and have a system of behavioral economics behind that. And again, we know that taking something away from somebody is actually more incentivizing than giving them a, a prize. So, you know, if you have something that, that they should you know, like in the case of Denmark, where they have a lottery system with multiple small rewards and, and potentially large rewards, you know, they get reminded that that opportunity will go away if they don't take their medication, right? And, and, and the patients actually love it because they're supporting. Yeah, and Steve, I would add to that. Last year, the Institute did a survey, a Zogby survey of consumers, a, a national survey of consumers. And and we found as part of that survey, as a, uh, uh, the results of that survey, is 61% of the consumers believe that it would be helpful to have a medication coach as part of their medical care team. So I think it's clear that they recognize um, what they don't know, but they also recognize what they need um, as part of that care team. So I know, Katie, that um, in doing some reading that the GTMRX Institute recommends a 10-step process uh, around achieving CMM. And knowing they're all important, certainly, which one or two would you rank the most important? It's hard to decide what would be the most important activity. Um, so perhaps I would say it's, it's, it's where it begins and where it should end. Um, you know, to a large degree, comprehensive medication management is a medical service that can be provided or, or d delivered at the population level. Um, and, and information is needed um, about that population. So I think 
identifying those individuals within that population, be it a physician group or an accountable care organization or um, a system that have not, those that have not achieved clinical goals of therapy, that's important. That's essential because it allows you to take limited resources and determine where you want to focus your time. Uh, with those with those limited resources. So that's an important, it's the first step of the CMM process, and I think it's a very important step. Um, the, the other area, I think, is the development of the care plan or, the, or the, the, the care plan and the medication plan in consultation with the patient or the individual, because that gets at issues around adherence. It gets at issues around ensuring that they really understand, because oftentimes they just don't understand. We were talking to a member company the other day. The instruction that that individual had in the hospital was demonstrating how to do an injection in an orange, and and they and, and the patient went home thinking that 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 they were supposed to do something similar to that. So I think really ensuring that that individual understands what the medication is, how it should be used, things to look for, things to be concerned about, and things that they need to come back to the treatment team with as part of that treatment team. Um, but, but you asked me somewhat of an unfair question because we believe that in order to ensure fidelity of practice, each one of those areas should have the same level of importance and the same weight, uh, particularly as it relates to it being an iterative process. Remember, CMM is different from just a one-off activity that happens with MTM. It's not about the pill. It's about how the pill interacts with the individual and how it helps that individual achieve clinical goals of therapy. It's about a process. Dr. Grundy, question for you and, and Robert and Corinne, please feel free to chime in. Uh, what are some of the most important quality measures around CMM in, in clinical care, which really links to uh, impacting good results and sort of standardizing the practice of, of CMM within different clinical teams? I think fundamentally the most important thing is trust. And, and that's why I think having relationship with a healer, a trusting relationship with a healer, I think is, is, is just fundamentally uh, really, really important. And I, th and I think the second is, you know, trusting relationship between the clinician, the patient, and the rest of their team um, in, in comprehensive managing care. Then lastly, I think you, you, you need to trust but verify. And the verification is the data. I mean, having that data loop and that data feedback, you know, to actually document that trust um, is, is just immensely important. Well, and I would add to that, that, um, you know, in our value-based contracts, there are specific quality measures that we are me um, um, measured on, things like adherence, okay? And that comes down to a plethora of different variables, um, Katie, many of which you've talked about. But um, formulary compliance, for example, um, for generics and low-cost generics, um, statin use in persons with diabetes and persons with heart with cardiovascular issues. And I will defer to Corinne. She knows those quality measures inside and out. But as you know, the greater our performance in those quality measures, the the greater the return on investment is in the value-based contract. So, and for the patient, absolutely. So um, if I can add to that, um, when it comes to data, so I get a lot of um, claims data coming from the payers in which I saw through so I could tell if the patient's adherent on the medications or they haven't filled the medication um, on a regular basis. So what I would do is I would take that information and let the physician make them aware um, that, you know, your patient is not adherent, um, to please have a conversation with them, have them come into the office, maybe have a discussion with that patient to see, you know, to go over the medication disease management, um, to make sure that they're adherent to their medications, or maybe 
they have any type of financial impact that is causing them to not be adhering to the medication. So there's always options out there that they can change. Um, so, you know, go back to data and pharmacy, you know, it's important that the data is clean, that we get the data on a regular basis. And that way, you know, when I do contact patients or the providers, you know, I'll have all the information in front of me. If, if I could add to that, Steve, I think reductions in readmissions for those that are receiving comprehensive medication management services, which decreases which decreases waste, decrease in emergency room visits because their medication is being, it's the right therapy and it's being managed appropriately. And there are also clinical measures that can be used as measures. And we've seen a tremendous amount of um, movement at the VA um, as it relates to managing just chronic conditions with the application of comprehensive medication management services. So there are clinical measures, utilization measures, and other accountability measures as it relates to contracting that I think are important. Coming into the last question, we always make to like to make it fun uh, for all panel guests. And Katie, we'll start with you. If you could snap your fingers and fix just one single problem involving comprehensive medication management, other than fixing the whole thing entirely, what one part of CMM would you fix and why? I would reward the interprofessional team that includes a medication specialist or a clinical pharmacist um, in, in order to ensure that services are provided as part of a medical service to ensure that medications are optimized. Corinne? I reside in New York State, so a lot of the pharmacists here um, do not have prescriptive authority like all the other states have. And um, and also a lot of the physicians do not have any, they're not as receptive to having a pharmacist on their team. Um, so I would like to see that changed. Robert? I said it earlier, I would fix the HIEs so that they were all in opt out. If we don't have access to the data, we can't act appropriately. And Dr. Grundy. So there's only one way to herd the cat, and that's to move the food. I, I would align payment with, with outcomes. I mean, I would pay a system to deliver care based on results and outcomes instead of rewarding them for delivering an episode of care, whether they need that episode of care or not. Well, to all members on the panel today, it's been a privilege and a pleasure having you on the show and speaking with you. And I want to give thanks to uh, Katie Caps, Robert Fortini, Corinne Leong Lee, and Dr. Paul Grundy for taking their time to chat with us today about comprehensive medication management. And for our listeners, don't forget to check the show notes for links to resources and contact information related to today's show. And stay tuned to the Innovation Accelerator podcast for more shows covering the healthcare IT topics that you care about. For more information on this and other healthcare IT topics, please visit Innovacer.com. I'm Steve Ambrose, wishing you a great rest of your day. You've been listening to the Innovation Accelerator podcast, brought to you by Innovacer, the health cloud company. Don't forget to check the show notes for links to related resources and other information. And stay tuned to the Innovation Accelerator podcast for more programs about the healthcare IT topics you care about. Accelerate your transformation and build the future of health on the Innovator Health Cloud. For more information, please visit innovator.com.